Good evening and welcome to our program tonight. Uh, it's a special program with a fantastic photographer. You've been watching some of the great work uh, uh, that Neil Leifer has uh, accomplished over a very long period of time. I'm Don Carlton. I am the director of the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History here at the University of Texas. And once again, the Briscoe Center is very pleased to partner with the OBJ Library to co-host this evening with Neil Leifer. Our continuing partnership with the LBJ Library uh, has included programs, book projects, uh, exhibits, and the center was pleased last year to publish Destiny of Democracy, which documents the LBJ Library's landmark conference on the civil rights movement. And we're grateful to the library for inviting the Briscoe Center to display a major exhibit celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Briscoe Center. And that exhibit, which is titled 25 Years, 25 Treasures, will be on display here at the library until January of 16th of next year. If you haven't had an opportunity to visit the exhibit, I, uh, I hope you get a chance to do that. This is the first time that many of the items on display in this exhibit have ever been publicly uh, shown. Our guest tonight is Neil Leifer, who will be interviewed by my good friend, Mark Updegrove. Neil Leifer's photography career has spanned more than 50 years. Beginning in 1960, his pictures regularly appeared in every major national magazine, including the Saturday Evening Post, uh, Look, Life Magazine, Newsweek, Time, and of course, uh, of course, most often, Sports Illustrated. Neil eventually became a staff photographer for Sports Illustrated before leaving in 1978 to become a staff photographer for Time Magazine. In 1988, he was made a contributing photographer at Life Magazine and spent the next two years dividing his time between time and life. When Leifer left Time Incorporated in 1990, his photographs had appeared on over 200 Sports Illustrated Time and People covers, over 200. Neil Leifer is the 2006 recipient of the pres prestigious Lucy Award for Achievement in Sports Photography. He's published 16 books, nine of which uh, have been collections of his magnificent sports pho uh, photographs. He's also photographed 16 Olympic Games over the years, 15 Kentucky Derbies, countless and I mean countless World Series games, the first 12 Super Bowls, and every important heavyweight title fight since Ingmar Johansson beat Floyd Patterson in 1959. He photographed his favorite subject, Muhammad Ali, on almost 60 different occasions, covering his biggest fights in over 30 one-on-one -on -one studio sessions with Muhammad Ali. Neil is now a full-time filmmaker, producer, and director, and he makes his home in New York City. His most recent book uh, is his delightful memoir, Relentless, which is a joint publication of the Dolph Briscoe Center and the University of Texas Press. The Briscoe Center has long enjoyed a relationship with Neil Leifer. Our photographic archive includes important selections of photographs from his personal collection. So please join me in welcoming Neil Leifer and Mark Updegrove. Welcome, everybody, and welcome, Neil Life. We're well, thank you delighted for to have you here. I've um, been looking forward to this for a while. Thank you. And congratulations on, congratulations on Relentless, which the, the, the cover which appears right there, and uh, your favorite subject, Muhammad Ali, proclaiming that he's number one. No surprise there. The greatest. The greatest. He, so, called, self, self, he called himself, the, his company is called the greatest of all time. So 
Yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty apt description. So let's start with the book itself, and then we'll, we'll wander on to Muhammad Ali. What made you write this book, Relentless? Well, you know, as, as Don said, I've done a number of books that are collections of my photographs. I've never done a book of words, and uh, this book is 85,000 words. Uh, I'm not a writer who could have tackled it without help, and I had a co co-writer, she, she took the transcripts of our interviews and fashioned it into a book, and it's Diane Shaw, who's here today. But I wrote the book for a very simple reason. Uh, I've got little grandkids, uh, and my grandkids think uh, that all I do is photograph them. They have no idea, they have no idea that I ever had a job. Uh, <laughs> the pictures I take these days are my fiance, Chantal Foray, who's sitting out in front here as well and my grandkids, and uh, I decided one day when they get to read the book, they'll realize that I actually once did have a job and maybe did something important. Uh, well, let me quote the book. I, let, me, let me step back and say that we are, uh, due to the generosity of Sports Illustrated, going to show some of the photographs in uh, Neil Leifer's uh, remarkably impressive portfolio. And, and uh, Neil will hopefully tell us some stories around them. But let me, let me quote your book. You write, there is something a photograph, even a great photograph, can't show. The story behind the picture, the people, and the circumstances that came together in that one one hundredth of a second when the shutter was snapped and an image was frozen for all time. I'm going to start with an image that so many of us know. It's just a, a brilliant image. Hey, Batmore, can we have that first image? I'm not sure there's a better sports image than, than this one. Well, uh, talk about this remarkable photograph and how you managed to, to get it. Well, first off, I'm so, so happy you said that, that there might not be. This is my very, very favorite photograph ever, and that sounds maybe like I'm taking advantage of the opportunity because it's up there on the screen. It is the only picture that has hung in my house. I hang it diamond shaped, I, that's Cleveland Williams on the canvas and I put him at the top and I have a large blow up of it and it has been hanging in my home in a prominent spot oh, for close to 50 years now. I collect other people's photographs and uh, so I don't have any other pictures that are my own photographs except for that one. And, uh, and, and the reason it's my favorite picture is very simple. Uh, I think that when you've done as many football games and as many baseball games and as many boxing matches, eventually you get a number of times when you're luck luckily in the right spot. And I know the word lucky always sounds like one is being modest. Well, I've never met a good modest photographer, so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure as hell not the first one. Uh, Luck in sports photography can be everything. Uh, if you're not in the right seat, if the touchdown doesn't happen where you want it to happen rather than where your competitor is, you don't get the picture. Somebody else does. Uh, so the Ali listed picture, for example, which is my best known picture and which most people would think would be my favorite and maybe the best sports picture ever, uh, that was luck. I was in the right seat. I didn't miss. What separates a good photographer from the ordinary one is that when a good photographer is in the right spot, he or she doesn't miss. And I didn't miss when Ali knocked out Liston. This picture, on the other hand, came from here. It was something I thought of. It never could have been done before. It was the first big, big boxing match in the Houston Astrodome, which called the eighth wonder of the world at the time. It was a brand new arena. And as soon as I went into the building, I realized that you could do something like this, which was impossible to do before, because the lighting rigs where the camera had to be fastened was simply much too low to get this sort of symmetrical image. Uh, you could put a fisheye lens up there, and I did, and you got more of a distorted image. The, the ring looked a little bit like a volleyball. But to get this, you could never have done it before the Astrodome. That combined with the fact that everything that could go right did go right. And lastly, when I look at my pictures, I've, I'm, I, I've had enough times when I was in the right spot for the winning touchdown. And you congratulate yourself when you say, wow, this sounds really good. This was quite a, quite a picture. Or 
big bang up play at home plate in the World Series. And then I look at the picture a week later and I see little things I might think, I might have done differently if I could have known. A month later I see more things. And that's what motivates you to go out and keep trying to do something better than you did even when you were very successful the first time. This is the only picture I have ever taken where there isn't a single thing that I would change if I, if I could. And so what makes uh, a good sports photographer? How is sports photography as a genre different from other photo uh, photography genres? Well, in my experience, at least with the exception of, uh, of perhaps photographing uh, wild animals, I did, a, I did a cover story for Time on the animals of Africa. Other than that, I don't know how many instances you, you, you cover an event where you have no idea what's going to happen that day. This could be the day when the champion is defeated. This could be the day when a, another perfect ball game is pitched. Uh, this could be the day when, for the first time in the history of baseball, over a 100-year sport, uh, someone hits five home runs in a game. When you arrive at the stadium, you have no idea what's going to happen on that day. You have no idea who the hero is going to be. You have no idea who the goat is going to be. And it's kind of fun, the challenge of just trying to be there and getting whatever it is that would be this, in, in a picture, the story of that game, the story of that event. And I always liked the fact that uh, there was a surprise. You just don't know. Animals are the same way. You have no idea. I spent six weeks in Kenya, and I saw one leopard. And believe me, we were looking. <laughs> I pulled up my leopard. I think I shot 20 rolls of film on that <laughs> leopard. <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, Balmore, let's see this, this next picture. This is uh, the fight that you were referring to earlier. This is uh, Muhammad Ali uh, in his second fight with Sonny Liston. This one in Lewiston, Maine, right. after having beat Liston in Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, and then what we, we, we see this image that's... Uh, uh, Muhammad Ali rejoicing in victory. But let's go to that next image, Balmore, and show the one that Neil referred to earlier. There is that, I think it's probably, as, as Neil suggested, the most famous photograph in all of sports, and it truly captures Muhammad Ali. And this was taken in 2005. By the way, just, I was shooting the fight in color. The reason the other picture is in black and white is somehow between the photo lab and the editorial department many, many years ago, the color transparency disappeared. It has never shown up. The fight is 50, well, the fight took place in 1965, mm -hmm. so it was 51 years ago. Uh, that transparency had got lost, except in those days, as soon as the editors chose a picture for Sports Illustrated to be considered for the layout, they would make a black and white negative of it so that they could run it on the contents page in black and white. And that's why that picture was in black and white. It exists only in black and white. So uh, talk about that moment. Do you remember? You know, number one, remember when I took these pictures, there was something, uh, I hope some of you remember, something called film. You had to put it in the camera. These weren't digital cameras, and you couldn't look at the back. And besides film, you had to focus the camera. And it's awful easy to be out of focus. So there are so many things one had to think about, in addition to which I was using strobe lights. And there's a power surge every time you fire the camera. So you're sort of counting off the four, three, four, five seconds before, this, before you can shoot your next picture or you shoot before the strobes are ready to fire and then you don't get a picture, you get an exposure that's much too dark. So I had so many things in my mind, I didn't know it, I had no idea what happened. What I knew when I took the picture uh, is that I, I knew that I had gotten lucky and that the champ was facing me, number one. Number two, I knew the referee. Often there are a number of instances where, you know, at that very moment the referee could have crossed between me and the fighters and you've got a picture of the referee's leg. I knew I had a clean shot. I also knew you, when I lit the ring, you lit the ring just like you're doing a fashion shoot or a studio picture. There was an optimum spot. This is the spot I hoped the fight would end. Again, as I said, you have no idea. Uh, and by the way, when I talk about luck, the most important proof of it, best proof I've ever been able to give anybody is the fellow between Ali's legs. 
baldish photographer. That was my competitor from Sports Illustrated, Herb <laughs> Sharp. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you what his picture looked like. <laughs> Did, what, what was your reaction when you saw the photograph? Well, when I saw the photograph, I thought I had a really good shot at getting the cover of Sports Illustrated that week. I mean, Ali only threw two punches in the whole fight, I think. And of course, they used a George Silk picture from Life magazine on the cover and not mine. It was page four. And I say this again without trying to be modest about the picture, because it certainly has taken on a life of its own. But it wasn't considered significant enough to make the cover of the magazine that week. How interesting it is that at the end of the century, in 1999, uh, November 1999, some, somewhere around November, Sports Illustrated did an issue on the greatest sports photos of the century. And guess which picture they put on the cover of the magazine? Uh, there you are. So. But I would, I would add to that, at the time that you took that photograph, it captures a great moment in a fight. What I think it does even better is capture the very vivacious, very defiant Muhammad Ali. And you see that, and, and he wasn't quite Muhammad Ali, the Muhammad Ali we, who would come into legend at that time. Is that, is that fair? It's very fair, and I would say this might be where the legend really began. You know, right. he, had, he had been doing silly things like calling the round, predicting the rounds, that, but he wasn't fighting great opponents on the way up. Now he's the heavyweight champion of the world, and he did this. I think the significance of the picture, quite frankly, is that this was this just movie star, good-looking, beautiful athlete. And I think this is the way people, as the years have gone by, and certainly as in recent times, this is the Ali people want to remember. Right. And the picture took on, I think, a, a, an even more important significance because of that. So let's talk about Ali. Uh, Don mentioned that you have photographed him on many, many occasions. But uh, and Muhammad Ali is perhaps the world's, when he was alive, perhaps the world's best known figure. Muhammad Ali used to talk about uh, when he would drive through the most rural uh, of areas, he'd say, I can knock on that door and people will know who I am. And that was true for Ali. So, but you knew him very well. What do we not know about Muhammad Ali, the private person? Well, I got to know him. I shot him a number of occasions posing him, but I never had so much as a, as a Coca-Cola with him. He didn't drink or a cup of coffee with him until maybe 10 or 15 years after he retired. And we became very good friends over the years since uh, I was in, actually in Arizona, uh, supposed to see him the week he passed away. Uh, we had dinner with his wife well, the week he passed away. And, and you know, he was just a wonderful character. I, I, I'm going to answer your question in a different way, Please. particularly since we're just on the campus of the University of Texas. Uh, I lecture for college groups occasionally on universities. In fact, I did the Frank DeFord lecture here a couple of years ago. And one of the questions I am asked from students all the time, and I think my answer is going to sum up why Ali truly was the greatest and transcending his boxing ability was the greatest. Just a spectacular human being. Uh, I'm often asked by young students how they can have a career like mine. Some of them are impatient, they're looking for a shortcut. Is, is there a way you can tell me that will give me a chance to have the same kind of career you did? And I've got a pretty pat answer for it. I always tell them, listen, I know the word guarantee isn't supposed to be used, but I'm gonna guarantee you a career as good as mine, maybe better. All you have to do to have a career like mine is find yourself a subject like Muhammad Ali and hitch your, hitch your ride, your, your wagon to his, uh, his life and, and follow him for 40 years. Muhammad Ali never saw a camera he didn't like. He never saw a reporter he didn't like. Uh, the whole shtick with Howard Cosell is a good way of looking at it. He just enjoyed people. He, and by the way, you did not have to be Howard Cosell or Sports Illustrated or Life Magazine. He was just as good to the photographer that showed up from the school newspaper. He just never said no to anyone. Uh, with me, it would always be the same thing. 
Uh, and yeah, he, he was aware that Sports Illustrated is going to put him on the cover of the magazine. That sells tickets to the fight. It isn't bad business. But he didn't care about that nearly as much as he liked seeing himself on the cover of the magazine, I think. Uh, he's, but Muhammad would say, OK, you took advantage last time. You, you, you asked me for 20 minutes, and you took an hour. Well, I'd tell him, I, I need 10 minutes this time. And an hour later, he was still suggesting things. Uh, one instance, uh, he, we named him Sportsman of the Year after he beat uh, George Foreman in Zaire. And the picture was set. Our editors, I had sold my editors on the idea of the picture should look something like a GQ cover. Studio cover with a white, soft background, this off-white background, and Muhammad in black tie. So, picked him up to take him to the studio. We've got, uh, he's got two garment bags with him. He's lugging along. I'm wondering, I mean, a tuxedo doesn't take up that much space. We got there, and before I could start shooting the tuxedo, he wants to pose in the two African robes that, uh, that President Mobutu gave him. All I could see is I heard the cash register ringing on the sale of photographs. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I spent an hour shooting the two, uh, two caftans. His new sport jacket had to be photographed. And we got around, finally, we got the tuxedo on, which ended up as the cover of the magazine. But nobody did things like that. He just, he made everybody that needed something, he made you look good. My boss always thought, wow, this guy Lifer is really, he's coming along. What a great set of pictures. We well, couldn't miss. Uh, it's funny, you know, because Ali passed away in June, as you know. The only other athlete, and I hope we'll talk about him, that comes close to him in my experience, and I didn't have nearly as much time with Arnold Palmer, but I did photograph Palmer. And they were the only two I, I ever met that were quite like that. Let's go into the next photograph, because you dovetailed brilliantly into uh, the sequence here. We, uh, of course. That's called luck. <laughs> I had no idea that was the next No, you didn't. Uh, we, of course, lost two legends this year, uh, Muhammad Ali and followed by Arnold Palmer just a couple weeks ago. So talk about what made this man so great? Well, I grew up in a low-income housing project on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, golf was not exactly the game we played. Uh, golf and skiing, I mean, tennis, we didn't do those things. We played stickball and basically tried to keep from getting in trouble with the law. I mean, it was more of that kind of neighborhood, and hopefully you grew up to become a good citizen. Uh, I'd never been on a golf course. I had never seen a golf course. When Sports Illustrated assigned me in 1962 to photograph Arnold Palmer at the Baton Rouge Open. Uh, I never heard of Baton Rouge either, I don't think. But I was, <laughs> I was very excited about going down to Baton Rouge. And uh, Palmer was such a great looking athlete. He never wore a hat, which photographers frowned on. Because unlike digital, which picks up the tone between the shadow and you can photograph digitals with a hat on and get, can get a face underneath the hat. It's very hard to do with film. Uh, Palmer was known for no hat. He always looked great. Well, the weather in Baton Rouge was horrific when I got down there. It looked like they were going to postpone a day or two. And secondly, Palmer had an ear infection and a bad one. And he probably wasn't going to play by the time. Well, it turned out he played with these wads of cotton in his ears. Now, we didn't do uh, and a hat and a sweater. And it just didn't look like a picture that could possibly preview the masters. And by the way, in those days, you know, as I suffered, uh, when a photographer appeared to shoot a cover, the first thing you heard about from the publicist that at school or wherever, was you're not going to jinx us. Uh, you know, that SI cover jinx. Well, there were more instances like this with Palmer. This is the Masters Golf Tournament, and we're going to put him on the week before the Masters was my cover. Anyway, I ended up getting the cover. And it wasn't my favorite cover, but I was thrilled to have a cover of Arnold Palmer. And uh, he had been very nice to me. I spent a good amount of time with him when I was down there shooting. I, you know, got to chat with him for a bit. But then I didn't see him for a while. Oh, got the cover, and he won the Masters mm. that year. No jinx. It's now a few years later, and I'm assigned to shoot the Westchester Open in New York. By now I was shooting golf fairly, you know, I had covered umpteen Masters and a bunch of US Opens. Palmer is, uh, is leading the tournament, and uh, I think it's the fourth day. It was either the third or fourth day. CBS television is televising live. And Palmer's 
ball lands quite a distance from the, from the flag. And one of the cliche pictures, I think, you'll see it, but it often produces really good pictures. On those rare occasions when the golfer chooses to leave the stick in and the caddy holds the stick, there's a really neat picture to be shot. Long lens, it was a large green, and Palmer was all the way at the other end. The flag was in the middle, and I positioned myself with a long lens trying to shoot under the arm of the caddy and get Palmer with this putt. And obviously, if it sunk this, this was a 60-foot foot putt or something like that. Uh, well, I'm looking through my lens. I'm congratulating myself because Palmer is actually, he's doing something like this, as I remember it. And uh, I have no idea what's going on. He keeps standing up and looking and going like this. Didn't phase me. I had no idea what he was doing. And uh, now when photographers, when the golfer complains about, certainly if you click the shutter during a backswing, or, and this was, this was a big tournament, uh, any official, if, uh, if Arnold Palmer had said, move that photographer, they wouldn't have moved me a foot or two. They would have removed me from the, you know, taken my credential away. And, and you have to be very careful about that. And, and the rules are fair. The rules, you're not supposed to be in their line of sight. But I was so far away that it never dawned on me that he was motioning this, perhaps, to me. Well, he finally puts his putter down. And because the other golfer's ball was in the way, uh, of course, where he had to walk, he walks around the outside of the green, all the way around the green. And I'm watching, I'm figuring out what he's doing. Uh, you don't line a putt up from that distance, even I knew that by then. And he got down on one knee right next to me, he put his arm around me, and he whispered to me, and that he remembered my name, amazed me. He said, Neil, you think he could move over about a foot? You're right in my mind to say. <laughs> Well, I turned stoplight red, <laughs> trying not to let the officials see that maybe he was talking. And I don't know if people, but all of this was on CBS. <laughs> As I never saw it, now, because they didn't show replays of, of that. That wasn't significant enough to make the evening news. But I, uh, I remember just thinking, what a decent guy, because it would have had such a different ending had he done what a lot of golfers would have done. It's right. just said, would you move that guy? He's right in my, my eyesight. Right. And I can't think of anybody other than Ali who would have done something like that. So maybe this answers my question. There's, there's, there was an outpouring of affection when he died at the age of 87 a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, we've had a lot of great golfers in, the, in the, the, the game of golf, Jack Nicholas and Gary Player and Tiger Woods and others. But there was something about Arnold Palmer that was different. Um, what was it? What, what made him special? Well, he had a charisma. He had a charisma about it. He seemed to really enjoy the other things that come along, the celebrity, the dealing with the press. Uh, by the way, I mean, Jack Nicholas and Gary Player would have been two of the others who were very anti, and not Tiger. I would not have added Tiger to the list, quite the contrary. But I certainly would have added Lee Trevino to that list, you know. There were, there were some of these colorful characters, but uh, I don't know, it's an intangible thing. It's hard to describe. I always called it a visual charisma as it related to my job. But as I said, I mean, we're all young, there are young writers, there are young photographers, there are young television executives. You're all trying to look good to your boss. And Arnold Palmer, like Ali, always made you look good. And, and what his thought process was, I have no idea. Let me quote Relentless again. You said, you, you write in the book, once I started to get published, your photographs started getting published, I realized that a camera could be my ticket to everywhere, a kind of magic carpet, you could say, to any place I wanted to go. So let's talk about some of the, place that your, the places rather, that your, your camera has taken you. And Balmore, let's look at the next image. This is uh, the 1963 World Series, Don Drysdale, who just pitched the, the winning game. Game three. Okay. Right. The, the wonderful shot. Talk about the, 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 uh, the events that you've been to and what makes, um, well, t talk about the greatest moments that you've experienced in those big events, the World Series, the, 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 the Super Bowl, the NBA championship. Talk about the, the greatest moments you can think of. Well, uh, e easy, easy to give you those. And remember, the ticket that I got was not a ticket in the bleachers. I said the camera was my ticket to get right into there. the event. It was a ticket to the best seat in the house. 
and access in most instances and beyond uh, you know, the events that would matter to me. Most of them, a lot of them are very personal. They may not have been my greatest known pictures, but uh, were I, I never dreamed that I would have 10 minutes in the Oval Office with Ronald Reagan. Just us. You know, I mean, the White House photographer, Michael Evans, was in there with me, but that was pretty much it. Uh, I never dreamed that I'd fly with Top Gun. I wanted to be a Navy pilot, not a photographer when I was a kid. Uh, I used my, I, I built little warships, the battleships, and I got to go to Vietnam with the battleship New Jersey, uh, which was a thrill. I mean, they, they produced some very good pictures and a couple of books. But uh, in sporting events, I mean, seeing Ali win, I covered all three Fraser fights. I was in Manila. I was in, and then having, uh, not only was it a ticket, but it was a ticket. People were paying me to do something I loved to do, which was taking pictures. I was a rabid sports fan and a news junkie. I moved to Time Magazine because there was a whole world out there I wanted to cover besides sports. And one of the great advantages of going to Time Magazine, uh, and we had a fabulous editor at Time Magazine, Ray Cave, who you know, hired me and gave me an opportunity to do things I never dreamed of. But uh, one of the things that, that was so appealing about making the move from Sports Illustrated to Time, because the same company, is I still covered the big sporting events. Sports mm -hmm. Illustrated uh, uh, wasn't the only magazine that covered the Olympic Games or a heavyweight title fight or a World Series set at Time. And often we did covers. Uh, our Olympic coverage, uh, our editor, Ray Cave, had come from Sports Illustrated. Uh, he and I sort of really had one goal when we went to the LA Olympics. The preview for the LA Olympics was to show Sports Illustrated how an Olympics really should be covered. We like to think we succeeded, you know. Uh, Ray says it broke the bank, but it was, it was worth it. Was news photography different than sports photography? Did you, did you bring a, a different sensibility to that task? I think a lot of the photographers, and you know so many of them, they would have, would have said yes. I think that what I used uh, in so many instances was everything I had learned in sports photography. Uh, I got a cover of President Jimmy Carter at the uh, Democratic Convention in 1980, shooting from the floor with a 600 millimeter lens, which is something that, other than a sports photographer, I don't think most other photographers would have done it that way. Just, just not used to using, you know, uh, that's a normal lens for shooting football or baseball. It isn't a normal lens for most photographers. Uh, I did a cover, where we looked at my favorite picture ever of Ollie Williams with the camera overhead. Okay, well I did an essay on prison, prisons in America. I spent a year photographing maximum security prisons. The cover of the magazine was exactly that picture with the camera mounted right in the middle of a cell a single cell, a prisoner at Attica. Uh, so I used whatever I learned in sports photography, I brought into my work on, you know, on, on just covering news, covering, uh, covered the White House some, I covered, uh, I covered, I said I did essays on the animals of Africa, I did an essay on prisons, I did a thing on carrier power. The remote cameras that I use so effectively in sports photography, I lowered a camera in an underwater housing from the bow of the uh, Carl Vincent, the USS Carl Vincent, and shot F-14s taking off from the waist catapult, side catapult. Those are things, those were exactly the same kind of pictures I shot in sports, except the subject mm -hmm. was different. One of the pictures that you feature in Relentless, going back to uh, what you were saying about being in a prison cell, is of Charles Manson. It's a haunting photograph of, of Manson. Talk about how you came to that assignment and what it was like to photograph. Well, when I, sold, when I sold our managing editor at time on the idea of doing prisons, uh, we were gonna try to do all the household words, San Quentin, Leavenworth, Huntsville, uh, Attica, uh, Reedsville, and George. Not Reedsville, I, I did uh, uh, Statesville in Illinois. And then I wanted to add to that, how does the best known inmate in, in, in America, certainly, What's it like? What's a day like with that person? Uh, and I thought of Sirhan Sirhan. Mm. I thought of uh, 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 Richard Stark, the Chicago killer. I think it's Richard Stark is his name, right? And, uh, the uh, Martin Luther King's killer, and of course Manson. Oh, right. And I wrote, to, I wrote to each of them. I just wrote a letter from Time Magazine, and, and the only one that, uh, that got back to me was Manson. He wrote back to me. And <laughs> we had a couple of letters between us, and, uh, and I went out and, 
And uh, no sooner did I get to meet him, but his, his condition was without cameras. The warden brought me back to, a, to of all places, the church, where Manson was, that was his job. He swept the church. Uh, and uh, we sat down, we talked for about 15, 20 minutes, and all he could talk about was how much is Time Magazine gonna pay him. I said, hey, listen, I just flew out here with an assistant. We came out from New York. Uh, you invited me, you know, and, and I, of course, all the while, I'm trying to be very careful. I don't want to take them off. I want to get the pictures. <laughs> but I didn't have a camera with me, and, and by the way, he's a little wimp. He's, a, you know, I'm not exactly six foot tall, but uh, Manson came up to about here on me, and uh, he weighed about 80 pounds, so unless he had a weapon hidden somewhere, which I suspect he wasn't, there was nothing to fear at all. I mean, I would have had no problem handling him had he chosen <laughs> to, uh, to make a mistake. <laughs> In any case, uh, we talked for a while, and he finally said, well, if you're not paying me, I'm leaving. And he did, and there was nothing I could do. And I flew back to New York. Uh, uh, really, it's the only time in my entire career I've come back with lousy pictures sometimes. I mean, it doesn't always so you're only looking at my success stories. This book doesn't have a single failure in it. I don't think <laughs> you brag about your successes, not about your failures. But uh, this was worse than a failure because I went out, uh, spent a lot of the company's money, and came back with nothing. I never opened my camera bag. The camera bags were in the warden's office. When we got there, the warden said, before Charles Manson will let you photograph me, he wants to talk to you. So I'm sitting in my office, my feet up on the desk reading uh, the newspaper one morning, and the phone rings. And there's some guy on the phone, and he says, about a month later, a month after I came back, I was very embarrassed. I had to go in and tell Ray Cave that I had no pictures, not, not, not bad ones, none. Uh, I'm sitting in the office, and the phone rings, and some guy's on the phone. He says, you need a wife? And I said, yes. He said, well, uh, Charlie asked me to call you. I straight up, I said, who? He said, Charles, Charles Manson, you're the guy that went out, spent some time talking to Charles Manson in Vacaville, which is the prison he was in. Well, I thought this had to be a fake. I don't know how he got to me. So I said, look, I, I've got to be in a meeting. Can you give me your phone number? And I'll call you right back. I'll call you back in half an hour. And the area code was, it wasn't 415 San Francisco. It was a Vacaville area code. So I remember thinking, that's odd. Got him back on the phone. He told me that he had been in prison with Manson for a couple of years, somewhere in one of the other California prisons. And he was now writing Manson's memoir. But the funny part was he looked at me and he said, not looked at me on the phone, he said, uh, I said, why is, uh, why is he going to do this now? He told me if we didn't pay him, he wasn't going to do it. We're not paying him. The magazine doesn't pay for photo shoots, you know, for, for news coverage. And he said, well, Charlie, like you. I thought that was a very funny. I see he liked me so much that I came back. I said I could have been fired. I exaggerated a little. I brought no pictures back. He said, well, look, I can promise you if you come out again, Manson will give you the time you need. So I went down to Ray Cave's office, and he'll tell you what kind of editor he was. And I said, Ray, uh, I, I can't, I don't have a clue what's really going to happen, but I got this call. It turns out Charlie likes me. <laughs> and wants me to come back, and he just looked and he said, you know what, it's worth the gamble, go. And I did, and I spent a whole day with him. But as I said, it was, uh, the pictures can, you know, I wanted him to look the way he looks. So, you know, he, the SWAT sticker on his forehead, for example, if you see it, if you see it when, you, when I met him, you can barely see it, it's a fading tattoo. When he's going to be photographed, or when he's up for parole every five years, he colors it in with a pen because he damn well wants you to see it. And I'd have been foolish not to take advantage of that in my pictures, and I did. Right. Right. Well, let me go back to sports for a moment. In addition to being a photographer, you are a witness to these amazing moments. So I, I got to ask this as a barroom question, but what has been your the the most exciting moment that you have witnessed? in the sports that you have covered? Wow, wow. Uh, I mean, there have been personal moments that were very exciting because I had a really good re personal relationship with the athlete, but uh, probably, probably Manila. Manila was, you know, it, it was a fight that nobody expected to be exciting. Muhammad was looking great, and Fraser looked like he was finished. 
and it's the best fight they ever saw. It's a third of the, the third. Of the Muhammad Ali. Uh, that would probably that would probably be it. If it wasn't that, it would have been Secretary. It's not winning the Belmont, but winning the Preakness because we put Steve. I'm sorry, affirmed who won the Triple Crown. We put Steve Cawthon on the cover and we closed the cover. The magazine printed two covers because the race goes off at 5.30 on a Saturday night. The magazine is on press at 6 o'clock on Saturday and our editor, again, this Ray Cave, wanted to beat Newsweek. We had very, yeah. Newsweek being out there made Time Magazine a much better, much better magazine. Yeah. And that, there were three races in that Triple Crown year. They all ended up with nose, uh, you know, six inches at most separating the two horses. And the two horses coming down the stretch at the, uh, at the Preakness, when I knew if a firm wins, Steve Cawthon is the cover. <coughs> when those two horses came down the straightaway, noses, just one nose apart, my heart sank. I've never seen anything that exciting. And, and maybe because I had something riding on it. It would, have been, it would have been the same as having a huge bet on the race. <laughs> I had a small bet. <laughs> uh, going back to the, the uh, thrill in Manila, as it was called, the, the final matchup between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier in 1975, uh, and you alluded to it, no one expected much, but it was perhaps the greatest fight of all time. That's one I ever saw. Why? Uh, well, I mean, you know, you dream of what should a fight. I mean, take a look at any of the boxing movies because they always create the greatest fight in a boxing movie. And that's what Rocky did, and that's what, uh, you, know, you know, that's what Raging Bull did, and even though it didn't single out one particular fight that was the best fight, with, uh, with, with Ali Fraser three, it just figured to be a boring fight. Uh, it didn't figure to be very good. Everyone assumed Ali was going to either knock him out early. I get you get very nervous at one of these things. It's very tense. You're sitting right. I mean, I was probably no further from Ali's corner than I am from you. So you're that close to to where the action is going to be when they're up against the ropes. You actually have to lean back because they're too close to you. This fight. I wasn't nervous at all because everyone knew it was a, we had a great time. We're in Manila uh, for a week uh, on the company's expense. I mean, how could you go wrong, you know? And, but, and, and I wasn't really worried that it was going to be an important fight. And sure enough, when the fight began, it was, I wasn't nervous at all because it, it started going just as everyone expected it would. Ali was beating him pretty convincingly for the first three or four rounds. And then suddenly, it changed. And it became kind of a fight. And then it got very one-sided Joe Fraser. I mean, Joe just beat Ali. I mean, I've never seen anybody take the kind of punishment Muhammad took. Uh, and, and then at the end of the fight, when, when it was stopped in the 15th round because Joe was beaten so badly, both fighters were just dead on their feet. In addition to that, I had done the preview cover for the fight uh, uh, when I put Don King in the picture. So now Don King, who had a bigger ego than Ali had. Uh, so I've got Don King, Joe Fraser, and Muhammad Ali, and that sold a lot of pay-per-view and a lot of what it wasn't called pay-per-view in those days, whatever, you know, you pay 25 bucks to see it in a movie theater, the fight. Uh, Don wanted to repay me, and so he brought me to the party the night after the fight that Emil de Marcos and Ferdinand Marcos threw. And there were no photographers there. I mean, Howard Bingham was there, all these friends. That was it. There were no other cameras in the room. Mm. And Don sat me at the table with the Marcoses and Ali. And, and so that ended. That whole two days was just, just a great thrill and an, an experience I'll never forget. Ali talked about that fight as being the, the closest he had ever come to hell. And it's true, it is a truly barbaric fight if you look at it. it is, is, has boxing become an anachronism because it is so barbaric? I think boxing is, uh, is, is always going to be, you know, uh, somewhat barbaric. I don't quite think, I think if it's, if it's monitored right and if the referee is doing his job and the ringside doctors, it shouldn't be. There's a point at which you stop a fight, you don't let a fighter get hurt. Uh, boxing is failing today, I think, because there are no good fighters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm no good fights right. either. Sure. Let's show the next photograph, uh, and this is of... Carl Lewis in the 1984 Olympics, just the, the runaway star, it seems, from that 
that Olympics. Um, Don mentioned, I believe you covered a dozen Olympics during your time. Is that well, right? Well, 16 of them. So 16, winter sorry, winter sorry, and 16. summer. Sorry. I'm not that old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talk about the most vivid moments that you recall. That we just had a Summer Olympics, a very memorable uh, games. Uh, what are your most memorable moments uh, well, among the Olympics that you've attended? Again, not one of my greatest known pictures, not one that's really pretty unknown, but uh, my favorite ever. I went to Tokyo in 1964. I had never been to Asia at all. I never dreamed of covering the Olympics. And and I'm sort of bothered by the way they've, each Olympics today, I'm just jumping ahead for a second, the opening ceremony, the tradition of the games works. They have traditions, the things they do. And one of the great traditions used to be that one man, it used to be, it could be a woman certainly, and that should be, uh, when the right woman athlete is there, they should indeed choose the best representative of the country to carry the final torch up to the and light the Olympic flame. And it used to be that that person, the whole stadium would just, your heart would stop and you'd sit there and finally in came this one runner and he circled the track and then he went right up the stairs to the very top of the stadium in the LA Coliseum or in, uh, in Barcelona or in, uh, in, any, in, in Moscow and uh, in Madrid, in, in London, and wherever you did, and lit the torch. Today now, they, they all, you know, in Barcelona, they had somebody fire an arrow to light it. In, uh, in Montreal, I remember they had a couple light it together. They've gotten away from the tradition, but my first Olympics was in Tokyo. It may have been the last, actually, Rafa Johnson did it in Los Angeles. That was the last time it was done the old traditional way, but in Tokyo, I was positioned in an aisle, oh, I must have been 50 feet from the emperor of Japan, who I had seen in all the war movies. I mean, and there was the emperor with his son, who is the emperor today, I believe. And, uh, and the empress was sitting there, and I was just in an aisle, and in came the torchbearer. And I mean, I remember I was shaking, and he came running around the track with that torch, and that picture, it's not a great photograph, but when that picture was chosen for the cover of Sports Illustrated that week, I, it was just a great thrill. It's still, if not my very favorite, it's certainly right up there at the very top. Later on, I had obviously better credentials and better opportunities to be in better positions to shoot, uh, but nothing, nothing, I don't remember anything as, as well as I remember how excited I was when I saw that torch for the first time. I, I'd seen Rome on television, I think, in, 19, in 1960. But in 64, there I was, and, and you know, I looked to my right, and there's the emperor, and then here comes this guy with the torch. I mean, I pinched myself because I didn't believe it. I could possibly be sitting there at that event. Uh, so what made you different? Uh, talk about what, what uh, made you pick up a camera to begin with, and why did you break out from the pack? I didn't get into medical school. <laughs> no, it wasn't <laughs> like my mother wanted to <laughs> know. Uh, I, I, and you know, the Lower East Side, as I said, was a, was a place where a lot of kids were getting in trouble. I was really never in danger of getting in trouble. I was a good student, and I wasn't going to end up on drugs or anything. But there, was, there were gangs, there were drugs, there were, uh, you know, this is the, uh, the mid-50s, mid to late 50s. And the way you kept kids off the street were there, there were things that they call them settlement houses, there are community centers in some other cities. We call them settlement houses. The Henry Street Settlement is still in business. It's about, it's over 150 years old, I think, now. And what, it, what they tried to do is they had programs to give kids an opportunity they wouldn't have had primarily just because they couldn't afford it. So for example, they had a music program and kids could go in two days a week and learn to play piano or learn to, to teach us, learn to, the idea was to keep kids off the street. All I wanted to do, in spite of my height, was go to the gym and play basketball every night, but they didn't let you do that every night. So one of the other programs was a photography program and I got involved in it and, and the importance of a good teacher really is, it, 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 I'll never forget, why I got motivated was because the lady who taught, a little Polish lady who taught photography and taught the photography class, and we had, you can go two days a week. 
And uh, she just made photography fun and exciting, and they gave us a roll of film because I really couldn't afford film or a camera. And each weekend, you were supposed to go out and shoot some pictures. You can go to the Bronx Zoo, or you could shoot. We had a contest every year, which unfortunately I never won. Always wanted to, but we had a contest every year on who could take the best picture of the tree in Rockefeller Center. So these were things that were accessible to everybody. How can you put your imagination to use? What, what are you going to do to make the tree look better than everybody else's picture in your picture? Uh, one guy reflected, took a picture of it reflected in a window. Another guy sort of got up high in the building somehow and had the skating rink below and the uh, skating rink below. Uh, but you would do that on the weekend. You shot a roll of film. If your class, it was either Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday. And the first day, they Nelly supervised your learning to develop that roll of film into, into a roll of negatives. And you would pick a negative. So the next day you came in, you would be learning how to make a print of the negative. And I just got hooked. I mean, I really liked it. And as I said uh, later on, when I found out that someone would pay me to do this and put me in the best seat at an event, I, even if I had, even if you have money, you can't get, you can't buy that seat. Right. And I had no chance to buy the seat of the bleaches, so. The, uh, the LBJ Presidential Library uh, has a vast archive, and included in it are 650,000 photographs taken by the White House team of photographers, the principal of whom was uh, Yoshi Okamoto, who uh, is probably really redefined White House photography in so many ways. But we don't have this next photograph, which I'll show you now, uh, which was taken from the lens of Neil. Oh, that's the wrong, I'm sorry. That's the wrong photo. There's a, uh, well, that's from uh, your, your foray in Africa, and that's, I believe that's Kip Kano. This is, right? no, it was, two, it was two Kenyans, but not Kip Kano. Oh, is that, is that a, okay. uh, in, a, in an effort to, again, to clobber Newsweek, uh, Time Magazine spent a lot of money on our Olympic preview for the LA Olympics, and I went around the world. I covered 14 countries. I know you're gonna to come to the Cuban picture later, so I'll wait right. on that story, but this was, the idea was to photograph the star athletes of various countries in front of the picture postcard of their country. So I did an Egyptian athlete with the pyramids. No Photoshop in any of this. It was all done for real. But it was the an Egyptian athlete in front of the pyramids, a, a uh, uh, the Indian hockey team, which were defending champions at the Taj Mahal uh, in Agra, uh, a uh, London uh, Sebastian Coe in front of Windsor Castle and running up, uh, etc. A great Japanese gymnast who won the gold medal with Mount Fuji in the background, the Chinese gymnast on the Great Wall. This was my picture in Kenya of the Kenyan runners. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the Johnson administration whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Except that Johnson was tall. Uh, <laughs> let's go to the next one. There we go. Isn't that fabulous? So that, that is President John F. Kennedy and Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, at a, uh, a Washington Senate. Well, it's traditional for the president right. to throw out the opening pitch, and I went to Sports Illustrated. I would die in the photograph the president. I'd never done it in a, with credentials, with White House credentials. And what the White House, this was Griffin Stadium in, in Washington. And in those days, of course, you could sit the president and the vice president right next to each other. Ev Dirksen's in the picture, Mike Mansfield's in the picture. The, Fox was surrounded by half of the powers that be in Washington. That's a who's who of Washington. And, yeah, and I was really excited about going. And of course, I, I confess, I wasn't thinking about photographing Lyndon Johnson. I was thinking of photographing John Kennedy, who, like Arnold Palmer, didn't wear hats. In fact, hated hats, apparently, and didn't wear an overcoat. And they sat for the game, but they sat down. And I thought, this is going to really be exciting. I shot some color as well. And I thought, maybe I'd get lucky and Kennedy would eat a hot dog and get a little mustard. In his <laughs> maybe he would emote at some point. And I wasn't really paying a lot of attention to Johnson until I realized that every time I looked up, Johnson was either eating, eating a hot dog, drinking a beer. He was jumping up and down, uh, rooting for the senators, I assume. I got more good pictures of Linda Johnson than I ever got of Kennedy, because there weren't any to be gotten till about the sixth or seventh inning, seventh inning, it started getting cold. And the first thing Kennedy did was put on his overcoat, and then he put this hat on. And years later, I 
for a period of time, I was fairly good friends with Caroline Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And I showed her this picture once, and she said it was the only one she could remember seeing. He did wear a top hat at the inauguration of her father with a hat. But the picture happened because he was sitting there again, still doing nothing. And I was really disappointed. I knew I didn't have an exciting picture. And then a foul ball came in the direction the catcher was running over towards the presidential box. I was in the White House pool. I think they call it the tight pool where you're sitting. There were like a, a wire service photographer, cameraman for television, and I was the magazine pool photographer just sitting on my camera case. The only time in my life I ever sat with my back to a sporting event because I was sitting about 15, 20 feet in front of the presidential box, maybe 30 feet at most. and. Uh, Foul ball is coming in the direction, and I never title my pictures. This is one of the few that I always say. And then this happened, and I like to call it the Kennedy administration leaning to the left. <laughs> you talked about uh, the ineffable quality that Arnold Palmer had, a certain charisma. Certainly Muhammad Ali had charisma as well. Did you see that in John F. Kennedy? Not that day. <laughs> no, I don't know whether he was with, you know, I did see it. I covered Kennedy twice at Army-Navy football mm -hmm. games. And they're fascinating. You know, the tradition is the president being the commander in chief sits on whoever the home team is that year, sits on the Navy side with the CNO for the first half. And then he's escorted down. I had a wonderful picture, which is a great trivia question uh, that I've taken uh, of Kennedy. The, the, he was sitting on the Army side, or the Navy side first, and he's escorted down by a midshipman and a naval officer to the middle of the field, usually the CNO, whatever, where he's handed over to the Army group. And now the Army group is coming back, and I'm looking right at them, and there's a little known general just behind uh, the president. And of course, it turned out to be General Westmoreland. Mm. But, uh, but, you know, I got great pictures of Kennedy at the football game. I mean, I also shot him at the Orange Bowl uh, once uh, in the crowd. And, uh, but at the baseball game, for whatever reason, he just didn't do anything that made good pictures. So I didn't see it. Right. Well, we'd love to add this to our archive. That's just a hint. Uh, well, now, now, wait a minute now. <laughs> there is someone in the audience who also, the one person I didn't thank is Karen Carpenter, right. who made the SI pictures available for the book and has helped you here We as appreciate well. that, Karen. So there's the person you want to talk to. I'll be giving you the Johnson treatment after this. <laughs> uh, the, so the next picture shows why Neil might have been on John F. Kennedy's enemy list. <laughs> I could have been working for John F. Kennedy. That, that, that. <laughs> So uh, this is also in the book, along with a, a fabulous story. Uh, talk about this picture and how it came to be. Well, before we came out, I asked, uh, I asked Mark if I should tell the PG or the R-rated uh, version of this. I'll do. I'll come down the middle of the road. PG on plus. That's exactly. Right. I like. I'll take that. Uh, the only picture, and there were 14 athletes around the world that I photographed, as I said, a Chinese gymnast, a uh, weight, uh, weightlifter in Moscow in Red Square. I did all of these things, but one picture, I appealed to the Cubans. David Kennerly helped me get to somebody in the, in the we didn't call it an embassy, uh, the special interest section, I think, in Washington, and, and I said, I wanted to photograph Castro. <laughs> for this piece because he would be the picture postcard of Cuba. And I wanted to photograph him with the great box of Teofilo Stevenson who had won two or three gold medals already by then. And it went back and forth and they never told you whenever you went to shoot anything in Cuba, excuse me, <coughs> even if it was for Time Magazine, they would invite you. They wouldn't promise that you're going to get Castro. Mm. It's going to take a cough drop just because I've got a little tickle. <coughs> Sorry. You're harkening back to the cigar, perhaps. <coughs> Likely. <coughs> Excuse me for just a second, please. <coughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I noticed this shot. It is extraordinarily difficult to get an audience <coughs> Sorry. with Fidel. Castro. That's why this photograph really caught my attention. Also, you, again, I'm, I'm coming back to the charisma. You, 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 your photographs 
more than so many that I can think of from other photographers, really capture charismatic individuals. And you see here there is a charisma to Fidel Castro. So to oh, he's another one you couldn't miss. <laughs> I did a portrait of him as well. And, but anyway, I took the pictures of him with, uh, well, first, when we were ready to pose the pictures with Stevenson, I told him I wanted <coughs> to have him with a cigar in his mouth. He took out this little cigarello type, looked like a cigarette. He was no longer smoking large, the, the big cigars. And I told him this wouldn't look very good in the picture. And he said, well, I don't have another cigar. This is what I'm smoking. And you have to be a little, you can't be afraid or intimidated when you're shooting at this point, this kind of thing. And it would have been easy to say whatever you like, Mr. President. But I said, well, I brought some cigars. I know you like Cohibas. And I had bought half a dozen of the biggest Cohibas, which are the ones he used to smoke. And I handed it to him. And he said, OK. And as soon as I handed him the cigar, he started taking the wrapper, the little, not wrapper, what do you call it? The, the cigar band sure, off the, the band. cigar, which surprised me. I remember, and I said to him, and by the way, Fidel Castro spoke fairly good English. He had graduated from Columbia, <coughs> Columbia University, <coughs> and his English, he just didn't like, <coughs> like to speak English with reporters. Maybe he was just a little bit not confident enough in his English. He, he started with me with an interpreter at the beginning of the session, and then pretty soon, he was no longer using the interpreter, he was speaking English to me. So we were now speaking in English, the session was over really. And I said, why do you take off the little wrapper, the band that's on there? And he said, because I'm photographed all the time and we have a very good cigar, we sell cigars in Cuba, it's one of our biggest industries. And if, I, if I'm photographed with a Cohiba, People aren't going to buy Monte Cristo or Romeo and Juliet or any of the others. He said, so I don't want anybody to know what I smoke. <laughs> and uh, so he took my cigar and we took the pictures. And now when I finish shooting, I have for years, and it's fun to look back now. When I started doing it, I just did it because I thought it would be fun to have. Now I look back and it's, it's nice to see these moments that were so special in my life. I always take a picture with the subject. Nobody says no. You're in the Oval Office and you ask the president, may I have a picture with you? You get the time. Even if the session is over, the president's gonna say sure. And so I said to Castro, could I take a picture of you? And I have a special picture I'd like. I'd like to have a picture of you lighting my cigar. He didn't bat an eyelash. I think he just took the label off my cigar. Is that right? <laughs> but he, uh, you know, if there is no label on it, well, I don't smoke. I, didn't, I never smoked cigarettes. I never smoked a pipe. And I never smoked a cigar. So Castro was using little matches. See, I could have been working for the CIA because he's got these little matches. His cigar is lit, and I can't get the cigar lit. And the first match goes right down to his thumb almost. And he blows it out and puts another one. He's looking at me a little bit like, get the damn thing lit. Second match, by the third match, he, he was about to give up. And now, now you have to know, my assistant was a guy named Tony Suarez, who was a Bolivian, whose first language was Spanish. And he is shooting these pictures from 10 feet away from me, so he could hear clearly what was going on. And right behind Castro, even though it looks like we're in an empty place, there were 20 or 30 people. He had a lot of military people came out because they wanted to meet the athletes. He brought not only Stevenson, but they brought the Olympic Committee, brought a bunch of athletes to pose with him. And suddenly, they are all rolling in laughter. And I don't, I don't speak Spanish and I haven't got a clue why they're laughing. They're laughing at me, obviously, but it can't just be because I can't get the cigar lit. Castro is doing his best version of Edgar Bergen, a uh, ventriloquist. Uh, he's got his teeth clenched, and he's saying something to me in Spanish, which turns out there are two different ways you can say it, and uh, I'll give you the PG-rated version, is he is basically telling me, uh, well, it, it's, he's, he's saying exactly what you would say to, you, to, to a little girl or a little boy when you give them a lollipop, and you're trying to tell them how to handle the lollipop, and he is, and uh, I think we finally got the cigar lit. <laughs>
Uh, we have one last photograph, which I promised to uh, Ann Wheeler, our uh, PR director. She wanted some eye candy. That is a 57-year-old Paul Newman, uh, taken in 1982, I believe in Connecticut. Yes, that is home. That is near his home in Connecticut. Uh, one of many uh, actors or uh, stars that you've taken. Uh, talk about Paul Newman. Well, time, uh, Paul Newman had just finished the verdict. It was about to come out and time, time did two, on rare occasions, three entertainment covers a year and they decided the verdict was a film that would be certainly around that Oscar time and, and the, Newman had never won an Oscar. His performance was fabulous in it. And we, I was assigned to shoot a cover of Paul Newman at his home in Westport. And he was, he, I spent a day with him. He couldn't have been nicer again, but this was, a, this was one of the pictures just taken on this property. Yeah. Neil, as we wind down, talk about the future of still photography. You're one of the greats in that medium. Uh, we've gotten to a point technologically where you can almost pluck a, a uh, part of a video out and make a great still photograph. So what happens to still photography as a medium? Well, it's a great question. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, not only uh, can you do what you're saying, and it's, and, and it's being done now already. You can do it pretty well. But uh, where are you going to get the pictures published? I mean, you have to have magazines and newspapers and they're all struggling. It's a tough time in that business. I mean, television, uh, cable news, you know, I think, I think the editor of Time Magazine, and I don't know her personally very well. I've met her a couple of times, but Nancy Gibbs, I think Time Magazine is an excellent magazine. You know, she's putting out a very good magazine. No one's reading it. I mean, here we are in the middle of a presidential race, and I haven't been to a dinner party that I can remember this year where someone said, did you see the cover of Time last week? When I was working at Time Magazine, that would, you'd have had that in every conversation. It usually would be the beginning of the conversation of an evening was, wow, did you see what Newsweek put on the cover last week? Mm. Or did you see what Time did? Uh, so the markets are going, and that makes it harder and harder for, you know, a young photographer has come to me that are full of enthusiasm, and I want to really, you know, I never want to discourage anybody. But what's in the back of my mind is, how are you going to make a living? You know, how you one day, you know, we all want to someday, you know, be able to support a family and, uh, and live nicely. And how are you going to do that in a business that is very tough? Uh, I hope there's, there's an answer to your question. I don't know it. Is, is, everybody can take photographs now with their, their phone, and good photographs. Has, and they're, they're posted everywhere, on Instagram, Instagram, on Twitter. There are all these mediums for photography. Has the, um, have still photographs diminished in importance as a result of the abundance of them out there? Or can they still be as powerful as they, they once were? Oh, I think they can definitely still be as powerful. Uh, all you, you know, every once in a while you see, you know, sadly, so often they're disaster events that take, you know, the terrible train wreck, uh, the, the refugees coming out of Syria. Uh, you're going to see them with this hurricane coming up the coast. Uh, no, a powerful image is still a powerful image. And I also believe, I'm asked all the time about his digital, because it is easier. It's a lot easier, but it's so interesting to me that the best photographers are still taking the best pictures. Whether it's uh, uh, Andy Leibowitz or, uh, or David Kennerly or uh, any number, uh, any number of, of great photographers that grew up with film uh, have made the transition uh, because you don't have a choice now. Uh, I, I think it's still a photographer, and, and the abundance of pictures doesn't make doesn't make them all great. Right. How many? It's not a matter of quantity; it's a matter of quality. And I think that the quality is still there. When you see it, you know it. Uh, I mean, there's a. You know, no matter what newspaper you read, there's always one guy you can pick out who's really kind of the dean of the photographers. Mm -hmm. And his pictures or her pictures are better all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, Neil Leifer is certainly one of the great photographers, as you've seen tonight. Neil, I can't thank you enough for being here. The book is relentless. Uh, it's still on sale, I believe, outside. Neil, thanks again for being with us tonight. Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you. Sorry about the coffee. Not at all. Not at all. That happened.